Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to Warhammer 40k, but not 9th edition. So this video is going to be a bit of an experiment that might go horribly wrong, uh, might be a total flop, or people might find very interesting. Either way, I'm probably going to enjoy making it, so that's why I'm doing it. But there's been a lot of talk in the wider 40k online community, I guess. At least I've noticed it. I don't know if that's the case for everyone. There's been a lot of talk about like the current edition of 40k, 9th edition, whether or not it's too complicated, or uh, you know what the various problems with it are and stuff like that, and whether people like it or not. I mean, I know I have my I have my own list of things that I think the game has issues with these days, um, and invariably the conversation ends up going to sort of previous editions of Warhammer 40k from over the years. You know, the editions that people grew up with and played with in the past. And, uh, you know, people start to wonder, well, they were, were, they, were they better or worse? You know, what was the best edition of 40k? Um, and there's no clear answer to that, because really it's just down to everyone's individual tastes. However, um, what I have observed over having had lots of conversations like this with people is that the one that comes up the most is 3rd edition. People seem to... there seems to be a sort of vague general agreement more often than not, at least, anyway, that the third edition was a lot of people's favourite edition of 40k when it comes to past editions. Um, and I played third edition. I did back in the day, a very, very long time ago now. It was towards the tail end of third edition, roughly a bit, little bit before fourth edition came out. I remember the Tower and the Necrons were already out. Um, and my first actual starter set was actually the 4th edition one, but I played 3rd edition before that. Of course, I remember virtually nothing of it. I remember having a lot of fun, you know. I have a lot of nostalgia for it, that's for sure, but the question is, you know, nostalgia is nostalgia at the end of the day. Was the game actually any good, is the question. And that's what I aim to find out today, because today, folks, we're not playing 40k 9th edition, we're playing 40k 3rd edition. Yep, that's one knackered old rulebook. And yes, that's where that Black Templars artwork originally appeared. For those of you who've got yourselves Black Templar codexes from the army set recently, you might recognise that, but this is where it originally appeared, because the 3rd edition starter set included Black Templars and not Ultramarines for once. Bit of a weird outlier in that respect. But here it is, the old 3rd edition rulebook. Now, um, let's see. I think before we get started, let's have a little general overview of what 3rd edition was like and what it was about and stuff like that, shall we? So, 3rd edition, or 3rd ed for short, I think it came out in about 1998 apparently. Followed on from the successful 2nd edition of 40k, and before that obviously was Rogue Trader. And um, I suppose one interesting thing to note about 3rd edition is that it was a basically a, it was a great reset edition. For those of you who were around for the start of 8th edition... You may remember that it was a big reset as well. The uh, you know, Games Workshop ditched all the old books. They released a new 8th edition rulebook, along with a bunch of indexes with all the army rules released simultaneously, and then the codexes came later. Well, 3rd edition was effectively exactly the same. Although they didn't sell additional index books, they actually just put the army lists in the back of the main rulebook, which uh, you can see here. This, this rulebook is quite thick, and it's actually very light on background narrative and fancy photos because they've got a lot to fit in it including the core rules and uh, as you can see all of these army lists they they had a complete army list for every army in the game now they're incredibly simplified i think third edition on release with just the army lists in this rule book and no codexes is probably the simplest form of 40k that has ever existed if i'm honest really super duper duper simple there's a lot of counts. There's a lot of count at counts as. Ugh, get your words out. There's a lot of counts as going on in this book. A lot of weapons are listed on on profiles, and then it just says in brackets counts as a plasma cannon or counts as a melter gun, uh, just to keep the sort of the number of rules actually down. They've got like a basically a core list of weapons. If I go to the back here, you can find it. Uh, here we go. Weapons table. This is every weapon that was in third edition when it started. For every single faction, that was all the weapons in the game. It's not a lot, is it, really? But that's because a lot of factions essentially had their weapons count as something on here. Now, as you can imagine, uh, it wasn't universally a popular move. 
because uh, for I think for a lot of people who played a lot of second edition, which is a very complex edition, this felt really dumbed down by comparison. But having said that, I think it was still very, very you know, a lot of fun to play. I think one of the main things people talk about with it when it comes to early third edition was how quick it was to play. Actually, um, you know, a game of forty k went from taking you know the better part of a day to taking maybe an hour or two to play. It was really, really, really fast because the rules were very, very, very simple. But there was still a lot of flavor in there, interestingly enough. There was still a lot of flavor. There was still the ability for you to do things like, for example, play a tank-only Imperial Guard army or something like that. Or you could play your Blood Angels where you had to swap out all your tactical marine squads for assault squads and things like that. They still managed to inject enough flavor in there through the unit stats themselves and little army appendixes that uh, it actually kept things kind of interesting, which is pretty good. We just happened to have opened the page, uh, the, the book on, on one of my favourite sections of it, actually, right here, because this is a very interesting little bit here. This is like an errata, frequently asked questions section of a sort. Um, the ultimate secrets of the galaxy revealed. And one of the things I like about this section of the book is it really demonstrates the uh, totally different philosophy behind this era of 40k, compared to the modern era of 40k. There's a bit here I want to read to you guys, so you get the idea. Who, who was it that wrote this, by the way? This was... Looks like Andy Chambers wrote this. Um, the first and most fundamental principle of war game rules. They are loose, woolly affairs which never detail exactly what you want to know in any given situation. Why, I hear you, Chorus. Isn't that your job, you charlatan? You may want to use stronger terminology here. It's because wargaming isn't played on a gridded out playing area with a set number of strictly defined pieces. Wargaming is all about colour, movement, and breathing life into the armies you lovingly amass and then drive headlong into your opponent. The number of variables in a normal miniatures game is simply staggering if you consider the diversity of terrain, armies, playing area, dice rolls, points values, and all the rest of it. When they, when they made this edition, really, and you can tell it throughout the book, they constantly are telling you, look, we haven't accounted for everything, please just apply common sense. In all these different scenarios, they have bits in here, like... Uh, there's a section, I think, here, here somewhere on Tank Shock where the, the author is basically just saying, please, please, please do not abuse this. Use it sensibly. Use common sense. Don't be a dick, essentially, is what they're saying to you. Which is obviously in very stark contrast to how it's done today, where everything is written in almost legalese. Um, every situation they can think of is accounted for, and if it's not accounted for, it usually gets count, you know, sort of explained in an FAQ or an errata a few months down the line. Whereas with 3rd edition, and I, I've never played 2nd edition or Rogue Trader, but I can assume they're probably similar. Really what they were trying to do was just give you a framework to work with. They were doing the equivalent of sort of Dungeons and Dragons, really. They're giving you a basic framework of rules, and they allowing you, the player of the game, to, to basically apply your own common sense and your own improvisations to get around any weird kinks in the rules that you might come across. Obviously, very, very poorly suited to anything you might want to play at a tournament. Um, and as this edition went on, there were a ton of FAQs and errata, and there was chapter approved, and they changed the rules for things like vehicles and stuff along the way. Um, well, th this edition changed a lot. It was around for a very long time, third edition. I think it was at least six years or something, because it came out in 98, and I think it was still around in the early 2000s. So it was around for a long time. Uh, and it changed a lot over the course of it existing. But here, right here at the very start, as you can see, it was very basic. And it didn't cover everything. And the mantra of the day was apply common sense. I suppose the other thing worth talking about really is the fact that even though this is probably the simplest form of 40k that's ever existed, its core rules are definitely a bit more complex than we're used to nowadays. With modern 40k, you have a very, very simple core rule set, and then you have lots and lots of army books that are very, very, very complex. With 3rd edition, it's kind of the other way around, actually. Most of the army books, except for the ones towards the end of the edition, were very, very simple. And the core rules are where a lot of the complexity lies, because you have things like blast weapons and ordnance weapons and flamer templates. You have fallback rules. Instead of when, you know, when units fail morale tests in 3rd edition, they don't just disappear off the table magically. They actually fall back, and they can regroup later and come back and stuff like that. They still play a part in the battle. Um... There are also really funky things in here like uh, guess range weapons. 
There are weapons that if you fired, like mortars, for example, where you had to guess the range of your shot. You had to eyeball it on the table and say, right, I reckon the target's about 36 inches away. And then the shot would land there. You'd roll a scatter dice to see it scatter. Um, and that would be your ranging shot. And then you would sort of like try and, just like a real mortar team, you would try to narrow down the accuracy of your artillery shells from there by guessing more and more accurately. It was uh, pretty interesting stuff, but obviously nothing like what you'd see in today's 40k, that's for sure. Um, I think um, a lot of people played this back in the day as actually you not being able to pre-measure anything at all. Much like Necromunda, they, a lot of people played it so you couldn't even pre-measure ranges for weapons and stuff like that. You just had to guess everything. Um, and it does actually say in the back of this book, I think in the in the section I showed you earlier, that they, the, 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 the designers of the game, they don't really take a stance either way they're like if you want to pre-measure that's fine if you don't want to that's also fine um but it's interesting that a lot of people did choose to play it that way actually i could probably sit here talking all day about all the major changes between modern 40k and third edition and uh, all the subtle ones to boot as well so i'm not going to do that i think the best way to demonstrate it is to by, by just showing you how it all worked uh, so we're going to play some 40k 3rd edition today. We're going to play a little bit of Old Hammer. Um, we're going to use the army lists in the main rulebook. We're going to play this as simple as it can possibly get. The core rulebook with the army list in the back of the core rulebook. And that's it. That's just what we're going to do. Um, we're going to see how it goes. We're going to see how long it takes to play the game. How complicated it gets. How often I have to keep checking rules. Um, and just how generally fun it is, really. Just see how the game unfolds, see how balanced it may or may not be. It should be interesting. At least I hope it's going to be interesting. I hope you guys find it interesting. Um, yeah, that's what we're going to do. So, welcome to the 41st millennium in the pre-8th edition days. The return of the Primarch hasn't happened, the Gathering Storm hasn't happened, the Cicatrix Maledictum hasn't happened... It's probably M39, M40, something like that. 40th millennium, 39th millennium, maybe not necessarily the 41st. Could be any time along that old timeline that you're encouraged to sort of play on back in the day. And uh, we're going to have a very simple battle today. This could be a bit of a companion game, actually, to the battle report I did with Dan recently, the Orcs versus Orcs one. Um, you can think of this as maybe like a prequel or something. We're on this Imperial planet. Everything's gone totally peak tongue. The Imperials are evacuating, they're leaving, they can't fight the overwhelming numbers of Orcs invading this world, and so they're getting out of here. And uh, today's matchup is going to be between the Orcs and the Space Marines. It's going to be my Orc Freebooters versus the Sons of Hades, my Space Marine chapter. And the gist of today's scenario essentially is that the Sons of Hades are leading a column of Imperial survivors through the blasted wastelands here to the nearest spaceport where hopefully they can get off world and uh, they're coming through this abandoned outpost and they're going to meet some orcs along the way so the space marine vanguard leading the convoy is going to move in here and what they want to do is try and secure the area so that everyone can move on through and carry on their journey and the orcs for their part they'll want to secure the area get all the loot kill all the yumis and uh, yeah just carry on their merry way as well the mission we're going to be playing is the very, very basic one in 3rd edition called Cleanse. It's essentially a game of table quarters. The player who wins at the end is the one who controls the most quarters of the table. And the way you control quarters of the table is you have units there, or vehicles, that are either undamaged, in the case of vehicles, or above half strength, in the case of infantry units. And it's really that basic. There's no objective markers. Um... There's no fancy objective cards. There's uh, no victory points to gather up. It is simply a case of getting to the end of turn six and then deciding, well, you know, determining who controls the majority of the battlefield at that point. Um, chances are it will probably come down to who's killed everyone by that point, really, if it goes all the way to turn six. Um, whoever controls the most table quarters will ultimately be irrelevant. Both sides may batter each other until there's barely anyone left standing on either side. We'll see. Could be interesting. I have played a few practice games of 3rd edition. I should mention before I do start, this is not my first attempt at this. And uh, 
without wanting to spoil too much, every game I've played of the pr every practice game of third edition I've played has been very, very close indeed. Very, very, very close indeed. A lot of people said that third edition was very, very balanced at the start, and I'm inclined to believe them because uh, every game I've played of this has come down to the wire so far. So that's the mission. Um, I should probably mention that this will be a solo game. It'll just be me using armies from models from my own collection playing against myself because frankly nobody else is insane enough to actually bother or want to play 3rd edition 40k with me <laughs> in current year. It's a bit silly. I'm doing this mostly as a thought experiment. Um, so I will be playing against myself effectively. Um, and that's it. That's all there is to say, I think. I've rambled on for long enough. Let's go look at the armies, such as they are. It's a 750-point game, and this is 750 points of 3rd edition Space Marines. I suppose the first thing to note about making the list for this was, well, one for one thing, I couldn't use Battlescribe because Battlescribe doesn't exist for 3rd edition 40k, so I had to get out uh, a pencil, a piece of paper, and a calculator and do it the old-fashioned way. So this is approximately 750 points of Space Marines. Uh, one thing, another thing I noticed when I was going through building this list was just how many models in my collection I couldn't use because they didn't exist at the start of third edition. <laughs> That's like about 50% of my Space Marine collection just I couldn't use because it doesn't exist at this in, in 1998. But here it is anyway, 750 points. It consists of the following. This guy, Captain, he, he is a captain, but as far as the game rules are concerned, he's considered a force commander. You get three ranks of, of, of main character hero leader guy in 3rd edition with Space Marines. You get a leader, a commander, and a force commander, which is the highest rank. And I've chosen to run this captain as a force commander. He's got a power weapon in the form of that sword, and he's got a storm bolter. Next to him, we have a librarian. And a librarian is a very similar kind of deal stats-wise to him. He has two psychic powers, no more, no less. One is Smite, which is very different to the way it currently works in 40k, but we'll get to that when we actually use it. And he has one called uh, Coruscating Flame or something, which basically allows him to re-roll hit rolls in close combat. And that's very important, because in 3rd edition, re-rolling dice almost never happens. Psychic shenanigans are pretty much the only scenario that I've come across reading back through all these old rules where re-rolling dice ever, ever, ever happens. The rest of the time when you're shooting and fighting and stuff with the majority of your units, you just have to take what the dice give you. You don't get any stratagems, there are no command points, you do, can't do command point re-rolls. Um, there's no warlord traits, there's no relics. Some of that stuff comes in a bit later with the codexes, but at the start of a, uh, sorry, third <laughs> edition uh, with the core rulebook, none of that stuff exists. There's a very basic war gear list you can give units stuff from if they're allowed to take from that list, and that's it. We've got a unit of Terminators, five Terminators with, uh, let's see, we've got the Sergeant with a power weapon and his Storm Bolter. The others have got Storm Bolters and Power Fists, and we have one guy who has a Heavy Flamer and a Chain Fist, although the Chain Fist will simply count as a Power Fist in this game because it has to, according to the rules. Um, the Heavy Flamer, of course, will be using the Flamer template. Some of you may remember that from back in the day. So that'll be a good opportunity to show that off. We have a Dreadnought. A very basic Dreadnought, because there's no other kind of Dreadnought you can get in 3rd edition. He's got a Multi-Melter, and he's got a Dreadnought Close Combat Weapon, which I believe has a Storm Bolter? Yes. You can pay extra points to upgrade that to a Heavy Flamer, but he's got a Storm Bolter. He could have Smoke Launchers, but I don't have any model on him, so uh, I chose not to upgrade him with Smoke Launchers. He's interesting, because he doesn't work at all like he does in 8th edition. He's a vehicle. He has armor values, and it's all very interesting, and we'll get to it later. We have one unit of tactical marines. They have a sergeant, who has a chainsword and bolt pistol. We have a missile launcher in the team as well, and uh, the rest of them have bolt guns. Very simple. But that's one of the two mandatory troops choices. The force organization chart in 3rd edition is very, very simple. You don't have weird, funky detachments. You literally just, depending on the mission type generally, but gen most of the time, you must have one HQ and two troops choices, which is exactly what we've got in this army with the Space Marines. So we've got one tactical marine squad, which is one of our troops choices. And our other troops choice is a scout squad. We've got eight scouts, 
The sergeant has a shotgun, we have another shotgunner, the rest have bolt guns, and one guy has a heavy bolter. And that's it. That's the, that's, that's the shape of it. There are no fancy chapter tactics. Um, as I said, there's no relic or warlord trait. It's just what you see is what you get here. It's a bunch of space marines. No more, no less. They're facing off against the orcs, so let's have a look at them. This is about 750 points of orcs, and once again... I had the same problem of going through my collection, realising there was a lot of it I couldn't use. However, this is what we've got. We have two mobs of orc boys. Each one is, I think, one of them is 16 boys, one of them is 15 boys. They are slugger boys, as far as the rules are concerned, because shooter boys and slugger boys are different units. Both of these are mobs of slugger boys. They've all got close combat weapons and sluggers, hence the name. We have a unit of truck boys, which is... One separate choice by itself. I think they might be a fast attack choice. Um, and they come with a truck, which has been upgraded with a big shooter, and ten orcs, which includes a boss knob with a power claw. And then finally, we have the war boss. It's Zog. I like to think Zog in his early days, Captain Zog, when he was just captain of a single vessel, and he hadn't yet built himself a big fleet. It's Captain Zog in mega armor with a power claw, uh, that fancy combi shooter thing is only going to be a slugger today, I'm afraid. He has in his retinue, now this is the interesting thing, characters in 3rd edition, they can move independently or they can attach themselves to units. Um, as far as the Space Marines are concerned, this is what's probably going to be happening. The Captain will be attaching himself to the Terminators and the Librarian will be attaching himself to the Tactical Marines. In Zog's case, though, he's taken a special unit, a bodyguard unit of knobs, and he can't leave this unit. They all together are considered one unit. And what's in it, essentially, is a bunch of knobs with big choppers, which effectively count as power weapons in 3rd edition. So they ignore armor saves completely, power weapons in this. There's no AP value for them. They just completely ignore armor saves. You have one guy with a slugger and just a regular chopper. We have one of the knobs has been upgraded to a mad dock who has got a power claw. And another one of the knobs has been upgraded with a war banner, which increases the unit's initiative. And initiative is a concept we'll get to later, but it's very important in close combat and therefore very important for orcs in general. They are all going to be riding in another truck as well, which you can buy for the unit for an extra 30 or 50 points or something like that. So all of them will be riding in that truck. And that's, that's the list. Once again, no warlord trait, no clan tactics or anything like that, no stratagems. Just a bunch of orcs in a couple of trucks, with some of them foot slogging. And that's the army. Right, let's go to deployment. Right, normally when I say let's go to deployment in a battle report, I skip straight to the armies being deployed, but I'm not going to in this scenario because things are a little bit different. So first thing we're going to do is roll off. And the winner will get to pick which table quarter they want to deploy in. So I've got a green dice for the orcs and a black one for the marines. It's a tie, let's roll it again. Okay, so the orcs get to choose their deployment zone. And I think the orcs are going to deploy in, hmm, I think they're gonna deploy in this quarter over here with this building. Because that gives them a fair old bit of cover between them and the marines, which means the marines will be deploying in this quarter here. Now, because the marines lost the roll off, they deploy the first unit. Now, they could deploy anywhere in their table quarter. So they could deploy right up here. However, you can't deploy a unit within 18 inches of the, an enemy unit, which means that the Marines in this scenario have a potential advantage for not being able to pick their quarter, because what they can do, and what they are going to do, is deploy their unit as scouts right up at the edge of their, their quarter here, right towards the middle of the table, which will then force the Orcs to deploy... 18 inches back this way, so the orcs won't be able to deploy all the way forward. So the scouts essentially are going to be an area denial unit at the front here. Now scouts have a rule called infiltrators, however that rule, much like deep strike for terminators, only comes into effect if the mission you're playing says it does. In cleanse, the most basic mission in the rulebook, infiltrators and deep strike are not a thing. So if you've got deep striking terminators or infiltrating scouts, they just deploy as ordinary units in this scenario. However, as I said, we're going to put the scouts up here, and then after that you alternate deploying stuff. 
And the way it works essentially is you, you, there's an order to it. I think it goes heavy support units you have to put down first. I don't know if the Space Marines have one of those. I think the, the Dreadnought might be heavy support. I'll check. It goes heavy support units first, and then I think possibly elites, troops, in a various order that goes all the way down, and then fast attack you deploy last. The reason you deploy fast attack last is because they are able to react the quickest to the enemy's deployment, so that's why you deploy them last. So if you've got like land speeders or something, you can decide what to do with them last after everything else, whereas if you've got artillery, they have to be plopped down first. They have the least flexibility. So anyway... That's what we're going to do. I'm going to get everything deployed in its correct order, and uh, we'll see what deployment looks like afterwards. All right, deployment is finished, everybody. This is what it looks like. Now, as it turns out, the Dreadnought was a heavy support choice, so he had to go first for the Marines, and he has been plonked down right at the edge of the table quarter in the middle. And as you can see, as a result of him being there, a lot of deployment area has been denied to the Orcs. They're all basically gathered up right at the edge of the 18-inch bubble he's created, which is pretty handy. He's quite far forward, isolated, compared to the rest of the force, but the thing about the Dreadnought is uh, he's probably the one unit in the entire Marine army that the Orcs are going to have the most trouble dealing with, at least in theory, because he's a vehicle. And you don't fight vehicles like ordinary troops. You have to penetrate their armor with an armor penetration roll. And a lot of weapons simply don't have enough strength to get through vehicle armor. So you can't just swarm a dreadnought with a horde of orc boys and expect them to just bring him down through weight of numbers. If their choppers and sluggers cannot pierce his, his massive, thick ceramite plates, they're as good as useless. The Orcs don't have a lot of anti-vehicle weapons in this force. Um, the main source of anti-vehicle is going to come from uh, the power claw that the boss knob that the truck boys deployed in there have got, and the various weapons that the knobs and Zog have in his truck deployed there. Zog himself is quite capable of destroying a dreadnought. Um, one or two of his knobs could probably do it as well. But, make no mistake, the Honoured Brother right there is a huge obstacle for the Orcs. Um, and I almost feel a little bit bad not giving them a couple of rocket launchers or something. But never mind, couldn't afford it with the points, so... As for the rest of the Marines they've deployed thusly, the Scouts will be wanting to move into this building and take up firing positions up there. Uh, the Tactical Marines with the Librarian have deployed between the two, ready to move up and support the Dreadnought if necessary. And uh, the captain and his terminators have deployed out over on this flank, quite isolated from the rest of them on account of the building being there. And you might be asking right now, you might be asking, dear viewer, if you've played a lot of 40k yourselves at home, why deploy them all the way out there? Surely you would want your captain in a more central location so he can provide aura buffs to the rest of his force. And the answer to that is, well, it's a trick question. Um, characters with a few exceptions, don't generally give out aura buffs in 3rd edition. It's just not a thing. This captain, as far as the game is concerned, is pretty much just a bloke with a sword that's a little bit more difficult to kill than usual. That's really all it comes down to. The only buff, if you like, that he applies is if he's attached to a unit, they get to use his leadership value for morale tests. That's really it. That really is it. Um, likewise, Zog, the war boss over there, doesn't apply anything particularly special to his guys either. He's just a big orc with a claw and some mega armor. And that's all it boils down to. So really, the captain, I've deployed him out here with his terminators because I feel like he would do that. They're effectively his bodyguard, although not officially. Uh, you'd need an actual command squad for that, but I, I don't have the miniatures for that, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, he's deployed out here with his hard-hitting close combat friends because uh, they're probably going to try and attack the Orcs on the flank and try and surround them as the Orcs pile in here towards the Marines. Uh, it also allows the Terminators the opportunity to move this way and maybe secure this table quarter as the game goes on as well, but we'll see. The Orcs for their part, well, we've got one mob of boys here. We've got the truck boys here. We've got another mob of boys behind these sandbags here and Zog in his truck with his knobs. There, very simple. They're all gathered together, ready to charge pretty much straight into the middle to crump some beakies. Now, all that remains is to roll off and see who gets to go first. Once again, green for the Orcs, black for the Marines. It looks like the Marines have the choice of going first or second, 
and I do believe they will elect to go first. So it will be the Marines movement phase coming up next. All right, the space marine movement is done. In third edition, there are only three phases in the game. There is the movement phase, there is the shoot phase, and there is the assault phase. There's no morale phase, there's no psychic phase, and there's definitely no command phase. So we're already one third of the way through the turn, and this is what's happened. These scouts have moved into this building to take up some firing positions at the windows. The tactical marines have stayed exactly where they are. They're not in cover right now, but the thing is, being in power armor in third edition, they're not going to benefit very much from cover because in, in third edition, when you have a cover save, you use it instead of your armor save, like an invulnerable save in ninth edition. Um, so <sighs> space marines rarely benefit from actually taking cover anywhere. Um, they're just fine wandering around in the open. The honored brother, the dreadnought, he's fallen back over here six inches this way because the longer we can stay away from the orcs and shoot them from a distance, the better. And that includes with him, considering the truck full of things that could definitely hurt him are actually quite close. And in 3rd edition, uh, a vehicle, a transport, can move and then disembark its passengers after moving. So uh, those orcs in that truck right there, they could move 12 inches in their following turn up here and then disembark, and then they could charge in the assault phase if they wanted to. So you want to give them a good clear distance to make sure you don't get caught up where you don't want to be. The Terminators, on the other hand, they're feeling a lot more confident. The captain and his termies are moving around the corner of this building here to confront this mob of orcs over there. Now, a lot of things have moved, which has consequences when it comes to shooting. The Terminators will be fine. They're armed with storm bolters, which are assault weapons, which means they can move and fire them as perfectly normal. There are no advanced rolls in this game either, but either by the way. You can't roll a d6 and move that many extra inches uh, in order to get more movement. That doesn't exist in 3rd edition. 6 inches movement is all you get. Um, the tactical marines, on the other hand, they are armed with a variety of weapons, which includes pistols. Um, well, the sergeant has a pistol. The librarian has a plasma pistol. These guys have uh, bolt guns. And there is a missile launcher. Now, in 3rd edition, if you move at all, you cannot fire heavy weapons at all. Just not allowed. The idea is that you have to actually stand still and set them up before you can fire them. So if you move the squad at all, they can't fire any heavy weapons. Additionally, with rapid fire weapons, just as usual, just like in 9th edition, they can shoot once up to 24 inches in this case, in the case of bolt guns, or twice up to 12 inches. But only if you stay still. If you move, they can only fire once up to 12 inches. So in this case, the tactical marines are very wisely staying still because it will allow them to get some shots down range at the orcs, which if they moved, they wouldn't be able to make. The scouts, for example, over here, they've got a heavy bolter, they've got shotguns and bolt guns, and nothing in that squad is actually going to be able to fire this turn. They've decided to use their movement for turn one to get into a better position so they can take advantage of it later. But for now, no shooting from the scouts at all. Um, the Dreadnought has moved, and he can still fire his heavy weapons. He's subject to a different set of rules, being a Dreadnought Walker. Because he's moved, he can fire up to two of his ranged weapons. And it just so happens that he has two ranged weapons. He's got a Storm Bolter, and he's got the Multi Melter. So he'll get to fire both his weapons as per normal. And that's the movement done. Now we go into the shooting phase. And this is where we come into an interesting point, because this squad here has a variety of weapons, as I said, one of which is a missile launcher. Now, one of the things about 3rd edition, and this is probably one of the things that people like the least about 3rd edition, and or a lot of the older editions, actually, is that you can't split fire in 3rd edition. The entire squad has to shoot at the same target. Which means that if you want to shoot, if you want to take this missile launcher, for example, and shoot a tank with it, Everybody else has to also shoot the tank, even if their weapons can't penetrate its armor. Which is a bit... Ugh, it's not great, is it? It's not, it's not terribly fun. The, the rulebook rationalizes this in, in the fluff text for it by trying to say basically that this represents them doing either a combination of covering fire for the weapon carrier and also carrying ammunition for him, so carrying more missiles to reload for him and such and such like that. But the end result is, that honestly, it's kind of a bit unfun that you have to throw away an entire squad's worth of shooting just so the missile launcher can shoot a truck, for example. But it is what it is. That's the rules, and we're playing by them. That's the whole point of this exercise, is to find out if 3rd edition really was 
all as fun as it was cracked up to be. So, shooting wise, I think what we're going to do is we're going to start with the Dreadnought and he's going to fire his multi melter at the truck with the war boss in it. Very simple, one dice. He has a weapon skill of, uh, sorry, a ballistic skill of four, which in third edition language translates to hitting on a three plus. So he does hit with his multi melter. Now comes the interesting part. We have to roll to penetrate the truck. The truck is a very, very, very light vehicle. It has an armor value of 10 all the way around the sides, the front, the back, everything. Which means that the multi-melter has a very good chance of penetrating it and doing some damage because the multi-melter is strength 8. And what you do is you take your strength 8, you roll 1d6 to add to it, so it's 5. So the total we've got is 13, which beats the 10 for the armor value of the truck, which means we score a penetrating hit. We then roll on this damage table that I've got here off camera, and we get a six. And a six with a penetrating hit basically means that the truck is going to explode. The Third Ed rulebook has a very nice quick reference section at the back here. Um, I wish these would make a comeback, actually. This would be really nice to have in all the codexes. But um, as you can see down here, here's the damage table. A glancing hit is what you get if you roll equal to the enemy's armor value. A penetrating hit is what you get if you beat it. And we got a penetrating hit, and we rolled a six, which means vehicle destroyed. A D6 inches explosion. Any models are wounded, any models under the, within the D6 inches are wounded on a four plus. Normal armor saves apply. There's no such thing as mortal wounds in third edition. Usually when you get injured by something, even if it's your own plasma pistol exploding in your face, you do get an armor save against it at least. The bad news is, for the orcs in that truck, is that most of their armor saves are a six plus. So, that's not good. The good news is, they do have a Mad Doc on board, and the Mad Doc allows the unit to ignore the first failed armor save of the turn. So, yeah, let's see. There's another thing I forgot to mention as well, actually, and that is that the truck is an open-topped vehicle, and when you shoot an open-topped vehicle, you add one to the result on the damage dice. So he technically rolled a seven there. <laughs> anyway, uh, here's the size of the explosion. It is, well, that's very cock, let's try that again. Five inch explosion, and everything caught within that is going to take a strength four hit, I think it said. Um, that's not great. Uh, as for the guys on board it, there's eight of them in total, including the war boss. So I think we'll roll for all the knobs. And on a four plus, again, they have to make an armor save. So three of the knobs have to make an armor save or they're dead. One of them does. Two of the knobs have been killed in the wreck. On Normally in ninth edition, you roll a one and someone dies. It's a bit harsher in this. It's a four plus, someone has to make an armor save. The war boss, Zog, he also has to make a save. Luckily though, he's got mega armor, so he saves on a two plus. He's totally fine, so. His mega armor has protected him from his own vehicle being destroyed around him, which is kind of nice. Now, um, we've got a bunch of orcs over here that might die. There are six orcs over there within five inches of the truck as it goes kaboom. So on a four plus, they are wounded. Okay, so yeah, four of them are wounded. Four of them can make, drop the dice, can make saves. One of them saves, another three orcs are gone. So, um... The Dreadnought's kill count right now stands at five orcs, including two knobs. That's not bad. And a truck, obviously. So, it goes kaboom. And uh, everyone who is in it that has survived needs to get out within two inches of it. All right, next up, with the orcs now ejected summarily from their exploding truck, these tactical marines are going to open fire. But actually, I've realised, not before... Well, the Storm Bolter, actually on the Dreadnought, would have fired at the truck, but then it exploded. So the Storm Bolter on the Dreadnought is wasted, so ignore what I was just about to say there. The Tactical Marines are going to fire now. And, uh, of course, because you can't split fire, everybody in this unit is going to be firing at the War Boss's mob of knobs. Now, there's one small correction to make over there, actually. Only one knob has died in the explosion there, because knobs, even in 3rd edition, do actually have two wounds each. So, uh, yeah, that's not bad. Only one knob lost. It'll be the, it's the one with the regular close combat weapon that died, funnily enough. Now, we have uh, eight bolt guns. Pistols are out of range, but we have eight bolt guns. 
And we have one missile launcher that'll be firing a crack, mi a, a crack missile. Sorry, not a crack missile, a frag missile. Come on, brain, get it together. This is basic stuff, this, you know. Uh, yeah, he's going to be firing a frag missile. And the way that works is we roll to see if it hits on a 3+, plus, which it does. We then place the blast marker over the unit to determine who is hit by it. And uh, judging by this, we want to place it, I think, there, which will catch Zog and pretty much everybody else in the unit except for the Mad Dog. The knobs will now be winded on a 4+. plus. Uh, because it is strength 4 versus toughness 4. And three of them are wounded. And therefore they will have their 6-up saves. One of them has made, one of them has failed, so that is 1-2 wounds. Another knob is killed. So let's get rid of this guy here. And one other wound roll for Zog himself. Is he wounded? He is not wounded. Okay, so there we go. That's the missile launcher taken care of. Now we're going to fire all the bolt guns again at the entire unit. Uh, these will hit on threes because uh, they are ballistic skill four marines. They will wound on fours. And uh, yeah, only one wound. Only one wound from the bolt guns. And uh, this will have to be saved on the knobs because in third edition as a general rule you use the armor save of whatever the majority of the unit is to represent them essentially shielding the more elite guys from incoming fire. So Zog is effectively throwing a knob in front of him to absorb the incoming fire. Um, they do make the save on a six though. Actually, no, they don't. They don't get a save because, and in fact, I don't think they got a save from the frag missile either because uh, bolt guns are AP5 which basically means that anything worse than a 4-up save, you just don't get it all. Your armor is immediately pierced. Um, you don't have AP minus. In in 3rd edition, you just have AP and then a number. So uh, AP 5 basically means if you have a 5-plus save or a 6-plus save, you don't get it at all. So uh, let me review the footage, and we'll actually see correctly how many knobs have bitten the dust. So one just took a wound. Let's see how many were extra were given out by the frag missile. Oh, I did roll one 6-up save earlier from the Frag Missile, and Frag Missiles are AP6, so you don't get 6-up saves against them, which means that two knobs have been killed to the Tactical Squad shooting, and that's it. Uh, the only shooting left to do now for the Marines is the Storm Bolters on the Terminators and on the Captain. Here we go, regular the, the Terminators, and I'll do the Captain afterwards first. That sentence didn't make a lot of sense, did it? I'm doing the Terminators first and then the Captain afterwards. Um, okay, so these guys hit on threes. They get to fire twice, up to 24 inches with their storm bolters because they're assault weapons. And they're wound on fours against the orcs. And uh, yeah, that's a pretty good roll. So four successful wounds. Now these orcs are behind a pipe right now. A pipe that I've knocked slightly, but they are behind this pipe, which means they're gonna get a five plus cover save they can use instead of their armor. And uh, armor piercing doesn't work against cover saves, which makes them quite valuable for armies like orcs. So one is saved. Three boys in this squad here are taken down from shooting. Now, as the orc player, I can remove any ones I like. Uh, I don't have to remove them from the front or anything like that. I can just choose which ones die. And uh, then we have the captain who hits on twos with his storm bolter. There we go. Wounds on fours. He wounds twice, and two five-up cover saves for the orcs. One of which is made, one has failed, so another orc boy bites the dust. And that's it. Now you'll remember I said there are only three phases in each turn. The reason for that is because stuff like morale happens on the fly during the phases as it happens. Now, in this case, this mob of 16 boys lost four guys, which means they lost 25% of their unit count, of their model count, to some shooting. If you take 25% casualties to shooting, or from anything else from that for that matter, I think, you have to take a morale check. And uh, I believe Orc Boys are leadership seven. So the way we do this is we roll two dice, we gotta get seven or under to pass. So they pass on a three, no problem. They're not bothered by the Orcs dying. Now we've actually got to do the same for Zog's mob over here. I forgot to do it earlier because they lost two guys, which is 25% of their eight-man mob as well. Luckily, war bosses have leadership nine, so they're okay too. So morale checks passed. 
That brings us now to the assault phase, and in the assault phase, what well, nothing's going to happen this turn. But in the assault phase, what normally happens is you make charges and then you fight, um, and so on and so forth. And you don't do charge rolls in third edition. You don't roll two dice to see how far you charge and see whether you succeed or fail. In third edition, you always charge six inches. No more, no less. Your charge distance is always exactly six inches, which removes any uncertainty. Um, and the only difference is if you're going through difficult terrain, in which case you then have to roll two dice and pick the highest, which in this case would be a six, so it wouldn't matter, um, to see how far you can go. But ordinarily, you don't roll for charges, you just move six inches. But since nobody's in, within six inches of any of the orcs, there will be no charges. Which means we go directly to the orcs' turn. So, orcs, turn one, let's go. All right, it's the end of the movement phase for the orcs in turn two. This is what's happened. This truck has moved 12 full inches up this way and its cargo of truck boys have disembarked within two inches of the vehicle, ready to make a six inch charge into these terminators that they can just about manage. These boys have moved up and over this pipe, which meant taking a difficult terrain test, which meant that they only moved four inches and not quite over the pipe yet, so they'll have to take another one next turn as well, but they're moving up to support these boys here as they try and take on the terminators. Now the Terminators do have a 2 plus save, um, which makes them very difficult to kill with regular choppers. However, the Orcs do have numbers, and the other thing they have going for them is they have a higher initiative stat than the, power, than the Marines with the Power Fist do, because with a Power Fist, you, there's a pro and a con. The pro is that you strike with incredible strength. You double your strength up to, uh, up to like strength 10 maximum. However, you always fight last in combat as a result. And uh, in third edition, it's not as simple as the units that charge go first. The way it works is every model has an initiative stat, and the higher your initiative is, the quicker you are to fight in close combat. Now, orcs are generally quite slow because they have an initiative of two, but an initiative of two is still better than a power fist, which always makes you fight last. So that's the one thing they've got going for them. Over here, the war boss and his knobs have moved six inches this way. One of the downsides to the mega arm that Zog is wearing is that he always moves as if he's in difficult terrain. So you roll two dice and pick the highest to how many inches you move. Luckily, he rolled a six. So he's moved his full six inches. The unit has also spread out a little bit after being blasted by that frag missile to try and get less of them caught under another one next turn. The boys are moving up behind him as well, and they too have rather sensibly spread out a little bit. This is one of the downsides, one of the infamous downsides of the blast templates, like this one, in old editions, like third, was that uh, a lot of time would be wasted playing games by people trying to make sure that all their models were the maximum possible two inches apart from one another in order to minimize the impact of blast weapons. I think the best way to play third edition probably is to just kind of not worry about that too much. Spread them out a little bit. But don't worry about it too much. I think I think if you just otherwise you're just wasting time and you're making the game less fun. So I haven't measured this up exactly, but I've you know I've spread them out a little bit to the to an amount that feels sensible anyway. So anyway, that's the orcs movement. Uh, we go straight into their shooting, and uh, there isn't going to be an awful lot of orc shooting. There'll probably be some sluggers shooting over there. The truck has moved its full twelve inches, so it can't fire its big shooter. And uh, these guys have some sluggers over here they might be able to shoot these marines with, we'll see. They've got to be within 12 inches, so we'll measure it up and we'll find out. Alright, so over here, all the truck boys over here are in range to shoot the terminators. So that'll be 10 shots from them. And three more of the boys from this mob are also in range to shoot the terminators, so I forgot to add their dice, so there they are. I'm going to do them all at the same time, just for convenience. And uh, traditionally, orc shooting always hit, well, it doesn't always hit on fives, but today it's on fives. Okay, so the orcs have managed to get a smattering of hits with their sluggers. They will wound on four pluses. That's not bad, actually. That's very good. That's above average. They get three successful wins on the terminators, and now the terminators have three two-plus saves to make. They do actually fail one, and Terminators do only have one wound, so one of them has just gotten incredibly unlucky. Let's remove this guy here. So the Orcs, probably to their own amazement more than anyone else's, 
have actually managed to down a Terminator with fire from their sluggers, wildly shooting as they clamber out of their truck. Not bad. Nobody over on this side is actually in range with any of their sluggers to shoot, so no shooting over there, which brings us straight to the assault phase. The, these Terminators didn't lose enough guys to take a morale test, so they're fine. Um, so yeah, straight to the assault phase, and as discussed, you make a 6 inch charge, no more no less, which means that these guys, having pre-measured it, they are in. Now here's where things get interesting, because in 3rd edition there's no pile-in move. You don't get the charge and then move another 3 inches to pile in. And what I'm about to explain is probably the reason why there is a pile-in move in future editions of the game. Because what happens now is the only orc that's actually in base-to-base -base contact with the Terminators is the knob at the front there. Everybody else can't quite get into base-to-base -base contact, which means... Well, it has consequences. Essentially, the knob in base-to-base -base contact, he can fight as normal. Everybody else can't. If they're within two inches of an enemy, they get one attack. That's it. No more, no less. Now, bearing in mind these are orc boys, and they normally get three attacks because they have two base plus their chopper and slugger. In third edition, if you have a pistol and a close combat weapon or a pair of close combat weapons, you get an extra attack. You also always get an extra attack for charging. Basically, in third edition, every single army has shock assault. However, if you're only, if you're only within two inches of an enemy and not in base-to-base -base contact, you only get one attack, which means... The, the, the knob can fight normally, but all these other orcs within two inches, they only get one attack each, which is severely debilitating in terms of their combat output. But there's nothing you can do about it. As I said, there's no pile-in move. Now, a lot of people might have house-ruled some sort of pile-in move back in the day, but I'm going to try and play this as close to the original rules as I can. Um, so that's the way it's going to be, essentially. A few of the orcs here within two inches of the enemy are going to get one attack each. The boss knob will get his full range of attacks. But the same is true of the Terminators. The only Terminator that's going to get his full range of attacks is this one here, assuming he survives. So, yeah, that's that's the way it's going to be. So, uh, let's do this combat. It's the only combat of the turn, uh, which makes things nice and simple. And the way this works is we fight in initiative order. And uh, the guy with the highest initiative is the captain. He's got initiative five, so he will fight first. Again, he'll only get one attack because he's not in base-to-base -base contact with anyone. Next up will be the sergeant. He's got initiative four with his power sword. Then will be the orcs with the choppers because they've got initiative two. And then last will be the terminators with the power fist and the orc knob with the power claw because they both strike last, which means they will strike simultaneously so they can damage each other at the same time and potentially kill each other. So we'll start off with the captain. He has three attacks. Now, he's a Storm Bolter instead of a pistol, so he doesn't get plus one for that, and he hasn't charged, so he only gets his base three attacks with his power sword. And um, he doesn't hit on twos, oddly enough. Uh, I think he only hits on threes, because in third edition, everybody has a weapon skill stat, which in the captain's case, I believe, is five. And the way it works is you compare it with your opponent's weapon skill, and then, much like strength versus toughness, you work out what you need to hit. And uh, in his case, he's fighting with weapon skill 5 versus weapon skill 4, which means he only hits on a 3+. plus. So he only gets one hit, the captain, and he has to wound on a 4+, plus, which he does do. Now, he has a power weapon, so that immediately completely ignores the enemy's save. So the captain has killed an orc. We'll get rid of this guy at the back here. Next, we move on to the sergeant with his power sword. He has two attacks. And he'll hit on four pluses. He, luckily, he gets two sixes. He'll wound on four pluses. He gets one wound, and again, ignores armor saves because he's got a power weapon. Another orc is dead. That now brings us to the orcs with choppers. Now, because they're not in base-to-base -base contact, there are only six attacks from the orcs with choppers. If they were all in base-to-base -base contact, this would be 24 attacks. So it makes a huge difference. <laughs> Now, these guys are going to hit on fours because orcs are weapon skill four against the marines' weapon skill four. So they get two hits, and they're going to wound on fives because here's the thing that caught me out when I started doing practice games of third edition. At the beginning of third edition, orcs are strength three. They're not strength four, um, it, 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 that, which seems a bit weird when you, when you look at the models and everything and you think about it, but 
you have to remember, at the start of 3rd edition, the orcs had much smaller, weedier looking models. Like, orc boys were much smaller, weedier looking dudes. They were about human sized and about human strength. So that's why they have strength 3. I think that might have changed when their codex came along in 3rd edition. I think that might have been when they got bumped up to strength 4. But right now we're using the uh, the cool rulebook army list, so they're strength 3. So they'll actually wound on 5s. So they do get 1 wound, and the terminators will get a 2 plus save. Which they make. Right, that now brings us to everybody who's got a power fist, or power claw in this case, and they all strike simultaneously. So I'm going to just roll the orc knob first, but basically everyone's attacking at the same time here. So the orc knob has three attacks base. He's also charged though, which gives him four, and he has a close combat weapon, his power claw, and a pistol, his slugger. So he gets five attacks in total. And uh, there's no minus to hit with this or anything like that. He hits on his normal uh, weapon skill, which would be a 4 plus versus Marines. Um, so he hits with everything. And uh, he's now going to wound on twos. So he gets one, two, three, four wounds. And they all ignore armor saves. And at the beginning of third edition, Terminators didn't have an invulnerable save. So he has now killed four Terminators. However... This is happening simultaneously, so the Terminators will get to fight back. Starting with the one that's directly in base-to-base -base contact with him. So, this guy's going to get two attacks. He hits once. He wounds. And, uh, yeah, that knob doesn't get a save because it's a power weapon. However, he's a knob which means he has two wounds. So actually, this knob is still alive, even though he's just been walloped with a power fist, because all these weapons, they just do one damage. You don't really get weapons in this game. Ah, ah, I'm talking out my arse, you see. I was about to say he only takes one damage, because weapons in this game don't have a damage stat. They just do one wound. Or against a vehicle, you know, they do a penetration roll. However, there is such a thing in third edition as instant death. If you are hit by a weapon, and you are wounded by it, and you fail your save against a weapon that has, has strength that is twice your toughness, you are instantly killed, no matter how many wounds you have remaining. So this knob, even though he has two wounds, is instantly killed by being hit with a power fist, as you might expect. This is particularly nasty when it comes to characters, because you can lose a Space Marine Captain, or indeed a war boss instantly, regardless of how many wounds they have, if they get walloped by another power fist, or a Dreadnought close combat weapon, for example, over there, or a crack missile, or a melter gun, or anything like that, so, yeah, that knob is instantly dead, and, uh, yeah, unfortunately, though, so are four of the Terminators, <laughs> apologies, I almost forgot the other Terminator who was in, within two inches, so he gets one attack with his power fist, he hits, he wounds, uh, another boy is killed. Uh, let's get rid of this guy who's up at the front. And uh, that is the combat concluded. So we have every single Terminator wiped. The Terminators are all dead. They're dead, Dave. Everybody's dead. We also have one, two, three, four Orcs dead. Now, it's important that we determine who has won this combat for the purposes of taking morale checks. And the Marines have just about squeaked by and won this because they've actually caused five wounds on the Orcs, and the Orcs have caused four wounds on the Marines. Which means that the Orcs actually do technically lose this combat, even though it probably doesn't feel like it. Um, oh, I almost forgot the Captain as well. He can certainly attack with one, one attack as well. Although I think we already did him, didn't we? Didn't we? I can't remember, never mind. Anyway, I think we did. I think we did. I'm starting to lose the plot a little bit, explaining everything. It's really hard, actually, trying to explain and play and commentate and film all at the same time. It's hard work. Um, anyway, yeah, so the Orcs have lost this combat, which means they take a morale check. Leadership 7, bearing in mind. They actually do pass the morale check. The Orcs are getting very lucky with their leadership roles in this game. Um, they do have a thing called Mob Rule, which comes up if you fail a morale check. I haven't even had a chance to show you that today, because they keep rolling low on their morale saves. Morale check, whatever they are. Leadership checks. So, because they've passed their morale check, and uh, I think there was a minus to that, because they've taken casualties. However, 
they outnumber the enemy, which is good. So they're not outnumbered, so they don't get a minus to that. And uh, they, yeah, they. I think they, they might be below half starting strength now. So they would have had a minus one to that, but they rolled a five, so they're still good. They would have reduced their leadership to six, but they still still passed it, so that's fine. Um, which means that the combat is officially drawn, and what happens now is uh, both sides roll off. So the marines get a two, the orcs get a five, so the orcs win, which means they can move first. Basically, now what happens is both sides move six inches as a sort of consolidation move to get more people into base-to-base -base contact, and essentially this means that basically we're just going to surround the captain with orcs. Like so. So he's not going anywhere. He's stuck and surrounded by orcs. His Terminator bodyguards have fallen thanks to that incredibly lucky orc knob. I mean, I suppose you could say lucky, but he was actually killed himself, so... Um... <laughs> It all depends on your perspective, I suppose. However, the captain's perspective right now is one that isn't terribly brilliant. I have to confess I'm very surprised by the result of that combat, actually. I, I, I moved the truck boys over here thinking, right, that one of them has a power claw that might be able to kill a Terminator or two. I did not expect them to kill one Terminator with slugger fire and then for the knob to kill all four remaining ones with some very lucky rolls. But them's the dice. That's just what happens sometimes. I've heard uh, Terminators from previous editions being described as kind of, they either, you know, they're either impossible to kill and also after the end of the game, or they'll all just die straight away. And on this occasion, they all just died straight away. In my previous practice games, they were almost impossible to kill. Today, it was different. There you go. That's the end of the turn, everyone. We did that fight, the morale check and everything involved with it, and that's simply the end of the turn, which means we now go over to Space Marines turn two. Well, that was a very quick movement phase. The only thing that's moved is the Dreadnought. He stepped back. Let's turn that way to look through this doorway, because I think he's going to want to shoot that truck with his multi-melter. And that's it. Everyone else has stayed exactly where they are. Now, uh, we're going to start by going straight into the shooting phase. The captain, if you're curious over there, well, he's completely surrounded anyway, so he's got nowhere to go. But in third edition, as far as I can tell from reading the rules, you, you cannot retreat from combat. Once you're in close combat, you are stuck there until it's resolved, either by one side falling back through a failed morale check or everybody dying. So he's stuck there. Right, we're going to start with the scouts. The heavy bolter and some bolt guns shooting at uh, the war boss and his guys. Uh, in front of them right there. I'm going to start with the Heavy Bolter. Uh, it's going to hit on threes. Hits all three times. It's strength five, so it'll wound on threes. It only gets one wound. And uh, now, here's the thing. Uh, I think I actually paid the points to give all these knobs heavy armor, so which means they should have four plus armor saves, which means <laughs> that some of them probably shouldn't have died earlier that did. But never mind, we'll carry on playing it as if they have heavy armor now, because I'm pretty sure I paid the points for that. Whoops. <sighs> However, with a heavy bolter, it's AP4, so you don't get a 4-plus armor save, which is what jogged my memory, you see. So uh, one of the knobs will take a wound. However, the Mad Doc will allow us to ignore that, so that's good. So it's the, the one, one ignore failed save, essentially, that the Mad Doc gives us a turn has now been used up. Uh, right, now we have the rest of the bolters. There are five of them doing single shots because we're not within 12 inches. Only two of the marines actually hit their targets and neither of them wound. See how swingy shooting can sometimes be in third edition because you can't re-roll. You don't have things like lieutenants and captains giving you re-roll auras and things like that. You just take the dice give you and sometimes what the dice give you is trash. <laughs> so... That's the scouts done. The shotgun and guys are not in not in range currently. That means we move on now to the tactical marines, and uh, they're going to fire everything at Zog's mob as well, starting with the missile launcher, which does hit. So it's uh, blast template time again. All right, we are placing it thusly, so it's covering the three knobs at the back. So the missile goes through past. Zog and the Mad Doc and explodes amongst the, the knobs at the back there. So there's three of them are hit by that. They will be wounded on a four plus. 
one of them is wounded. And uh, he does get his 4 plus heavy armor save. Which he makes. So the frag missile does nothing. The frag missile, it does nothing. Uh, now we have all the bolt guns to do. Now, the, the librarian, I haven't forgotten about him, folks. Some of you might be going, well, about the librarian? What about his psychic powers? He has smite and he has coruscating flame. Coruscating flame is in the close combat. Smite, on the other hand, is used like a shooting weapon in the shooting phase. Unfortunately, it has a range of 12 inches. And we're not within 12 inches right now. So I haven't had an opportunity to use smite just yet. But trust me, it will happen eventually. So now we have all these bolt guns to shoot. Eight of them, to be precise, lobbing some mass reactive exploding shells amongst the war boss and his cronies. We have two misses. Three misses, pardon me. And we have three successful wounds. Every armor saves. One's made, two are failed, which means that another knob bites the dust. I think we will remove this guy here. Up next is the Dreadnought. He's going to fire his multi-melter at that truck. Does he hit? He does. Does he penetrate? A 4 plus 8 equals 12, which means it is very much penetrated. And it's open top, so plus 1 to the damage roll. It's a 2, which then becomes a 3, which is a weapon destroyed result. One weapon chosen by the opponent is destroyed. The uh, truck only has one weapon. It has a big shooter. So effectively, what the, uh, the Dreadnought has done is it's taken his multi-melter and he's shot that uh, he's shot the big shooter right off the top of the truck. Now, he's also got his Storm Bolter, and the Storm Bolter strength 4, which means if he rolls any 6s to penetrate, he could actually penetrate, or get a glancing hit at least, on the truck, because it's got an armor value of 10. So here we go. Can we get lucky with a Storm Bolter? He gets one hit. Penetration roll is a 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Unfortunately, not enough. The shot bounces straight off the side of the truck. It is still going, but uh, that, that that big shooter on the top of it has been melted into slag. We're back in the assault phase now. Shooting is done, which means we find ourselves with this combat over here. And uh, the captain, lucky for him, even though he's surrounded, he will get to attack first. Because he has the highest initiative out of everybody involved. He has three attacks with his power weapon. He will hit on threes against these orc scum. He will wound them on fours. He gets two wounds. Two orc boys are immediately killed. No saves allowed. Now we have... Now they're not technically quite in base contact there because their weapons and stuff keep getting in the way, but there we go. That's better. Right, now the orcs get to attack back. They will have three attacks each. Now because of the captain's superior weapon skill, these orcs will only hit him on fives as he parries and dodges away from their clumsy attacks, which means that the orcs actually only get two hits. They'll also only wound him on fives, because remember, they are strength three. They get one wound on him, and he has a three plus armor save, which he makes. So the captain has now killed two of those orcs, and has suffered absolutely no hits in return. They couldn't land a blow on him. Well, they landed one, but it didn't do anything to him. So, having killed two orcs, and the orcs having got nothing in return, the orcs have lost this combat, which means that they have to take a morale check. Now, they have lost over 50% of their original starting number, so they get a minus one to this. That's a six. That's actually equal to the six they would get from the minus one to their leadership, which means they pass the test yet again by the skin of their teeth. These orcs just really want to fight today. They just, they're not interested in running away. And none, none of that pansy nonsense like self-preservation. Oh, no. We want to fight. We, we want to kill some beakies. So, yeah. Uh, that concludes the turn. Space Marines turn two is done. Straight on over to Orcs turn two. And you can see that this is really starting to speed up now. All right. The Orc movement is done. For turn two. We on Orcs turn two. I'm starting to lose track, if I'm honest with you. Let's see. You guys started there. You moved across there got stuck he moved again here right yeah it's turn two <laughs> so this mob of boys oh, they are having some difficulties with this pipe it seems um they rolled a four 
on their difficult terrain test last turn to try and get over the pipe. And this turn they rolled a three, which was enough to finally get them all over it, so they won't have any more difficult terrain tests to do. But my goodness, they made a pig's ear of getting across that, didn't they? My camera's on low battery again, so expect lots of random cuts in the editing, folks. Apologies for that. Uh, anyway, what I was about to say is they, they, the captain here has gotten lucky. The, the boys making such a poor job of getting over these pipes has bought him a little bit of extra time to deal with his current uh, aggressors before dealing with the next incoming wave or possibly just making his escape back in this direction towards the safety of his own lines, which would probably be the sensible thing to do. Anyway, uh, what else has happened? Well, this truck has removed, uh, removed, reversed is what I meant to say. It's reversed 12 inches back this way. It has no further part to play in this battle other than it can secure this table quarter by itself if all the other orcs have moved out of it, which at this point they're about to do. So this truck can stay here and try and secure this table quarter for possibly the end of the game. We shall see. Over here, well, the war boss, as I said, every time he moves, he counts as a being in difficult terrain because that mega armor is pretty heavy. And he rolled only a three. So he and his mo and his and his, his, his knobs have, have, have just sort of shuffled over this way a little bit, still still not quite being able to get in range of charging these marines or these scouts in here or the dreadnought. The marines are doing what they should do really right now, which is try and stay back and get as many rounds of shooting in as they can before the orcs arrive in melee. You don't get to kill an awful lot with your shooting sometimes with marines because third edition just isn't as lethal um, as later editions like ninth are, but it's free kills, basically, that the enemy can't retaliate with. So it kind of works out. Uh, the boys behind them, they've moved their full six inches up this way. They're coming up behind the war boss. They'll be round in the corner pretty soon. And that's the extent of the movement. We're now going to go to shooting. And uh, I think there might be some stuff within 12 inch range. Uh, obviously, the big shooter on the truck has been destroyed by that melter shot from the dreadnought. So there will be no shooting from the truck. But, um, and obviously this, these guys over here, nobody can shoot at the captain because he's locked in combat. Um, and in third edition, you can't fire into combat with other units. Just like in any other edition of the game, I think, really, uh, with a few exceptions anyway. So really all it's going to be now is just checking how many orcs over here are within 12 inches range with their sluggers to shoot either some scouts or some tactical marines. Right, as luck would have it, all the knobs and the war boss are within range. They're actually going to shoot the scouts in here. Them squishy yumis hiding in those windows. Get them. Fives to hit. Two hits. Fours to wound. Two wounds. And the scouts only have a four plus save. They're in a building right now, which uh, I think would ordinarily give them a five plus cover save. So that's useless to them. You only get a four plus cover save. Uh, the four plus cover save is the best you can get. And the only thing that gives it to you, I think, is stuff like bunkers and trenches. So, uh... Yeah, two four-up saves for the scouts, and they fail two of them. So two scouts, I'm afraid, take slug rounds to the edge through the windows. All right, it's the orcs assault phased out, and nobody over there is able to charge. You're not able to charge either. They're more than six inches away from the captain. So essentially, we just go to this one little scuffle over here, and uh, we, we do a repeat of last time, essentially. The captain strikes first with initiative five, ahead of all the orcs around him with initiative two. He will hit on three pluses with his three attacks. He only hits once. Oh dear, wounds on a four plus. He doesn't wound, so no walks killed. Oh dear, and he was doing so well. <sighs> Sorry, low battery warnings again. I sat and charged this thing for 10 minutes and now it's already back down to like 18% battery, so. I'm getting a camcorder at the end of the month. Uh, next paycheck, I'm, I'm officially buying a proper camcorder because I'm fed up of trying to use this thing. Anyway, uh, right, the orcs get to attack next. And they didn't charge this turn. So they get three attacks each. I'm fishing the dice out of my pocket right now. There is four of them. And, as discussed before, they will only hit on fives because the captain is a superior combatant to they are. Well, to them. With their weapon skill of four. So, luckily, though, they've gone quite... Quite a quite a chunky old roll there, actually. That was just not bad. Let's see, they have wound. Ooh, yes, that's a really good roll. Okay, the captain is now gonna have to get quite lucky 
with his armor save, so three plus. Right, he fails two of them, and Force Commanders have three wounds, which in 3rd edition is considered quite a lot, actually. Um, so, he is actually still alive. He has one wound remaining, but um, he has officially lost that combat, which is interesting. So, because he took, he took two wounds, and the Orcs didn't take any. So, leadership check for him. He is outnumbered quite heavily now in close combat. I think he's out, he's officially outnumbered four to one. So, I think he's going to have like a minus three to his leadership role for this. He does have leadership nine, though. And he does boss the leadership test. So, he's sticking around. The combat is officially drawn once again, and the fight continues. Alright, so it's Space Marines turn three. We're officially halfway through the game already. And uh, the movement phase is done. The Dreadnought, the Honoured Brother, he has moved six inches this way into the middle of the ruined church. Uh, he would like, very much, to shoot that truck with his multi-melter, get rid of it so it's no longer scoring that table quarter, and then charge the war boss. I think that's what he'd like to do. The tactical marines have stayed exactly where they are, as have the scouts, as has naturally the captain. He doesn't get a choice. So, we're going to start off with these scouts in this ruin shooting at these orcs over here. They're going to be shooting at the war boss's mob, and uh, this is going to be their shotguns and bolt guns to begin with. Okay, and they are rapid firing now. They are within 12 inches, so two shots each. Uh, okay, wounding on fours, ooh, only two wounds, heavy armor saves, four pluses, the knobs boss it, now the heavy bolter, three hits, three wounds, and uh, the knobs do not get an armor save against this because heavy bolters are AP4, so one of these we can ignore thanks to the mad doc. Two go through. So another knob is killed. And I think we're going to kill off the... Uh, I think we'll have to kill off the banner. Because we need to keep the power claw guy here around. Because we might need him to kill the dreadnought. So unfortunately, the lovely wild banner I painted up before this game... <laughs> uh, is going to be destroyed. What this would have done was it would, be, it would allow the orcs to fight at initiative 4 instead of initiative 3 in combat, which would have been very helpful, but not today, it would seem. Right, okay, that's all the scouts have fired. Now it's going to be rapid-fire shots from all of the tactical marines here, and the missile launcher, and the librarian will cast smite as well. Everything is going to be at the knobs. All right, the orcs have officially crossed into our kill zone that we've meticulously laid out, and here come the shots. Not a lot of misses, it has to be said. Now, wounding on fours. Okay. And these are all going to be... Well, I suppose we should start taking these one at a time, right? Uh, four plus, heavy armor. Saved. Four plus, heavy armor. Failed. Knob takes a wound. Four plus, heavy armor. Failed. Knob is dead. So that's either going to be the mad, the, the mad doc or the knob with the power claw. I think I'm going to have to kill the mad doc. Um, another one. Passed. Failed. Passed. Passed. Okay, so power claw knob. He has one wound remaining and we're not even done yet. Missile launcher next, firing a frag missile. It is a hit. The blast marker is going to go right there on the knob that's already injured. Uh, wounds him on a 4+. plus. Doesn't wound him, though. The frag missile was apparently a dud. Then we have the librarian, who can use smite. Smite has twelve inch a 12-inch range. It's considered an assault weapon. Um, it is strength 4 and it is AP 2, so in real terms, nobody in the game gets a save against it. However, he has to pass a leadership test first in order to cast his power. Luckily, he is a librarian and therefore has leadership 9, but 
yeah, he passes it. If he'd rolled double one or a 12, um, he would have had a Perils of the Warp, just like in ninth edition, but he didn't. So, um, it is a blast weapon in addition as well, actually, technically. So, actually, I think, I didn't think I could do it earlier, but actually we can get the blast marker over both these guys. So, strength four. So, one, do we wound Zog? No. Do we wound the other knob? No, we don't. So, the smite was ineffective. The bolts of lightning did not hurt either of those orcs. Whew, lucky buggers, because if uh, if it had, they would have, wouldn't have gotten a save. All right, that's everything. That's all these guys have got. The uh, when the, when I did the bolt shots, by the way, I did include um, the pistol from the sergeant. And pistols in third edition, if you stay still, and the enemy's in range, you can fire a pistol twice instead of just once, which is kind of nice. So the bolt pistol got to fire twice. Now then. Uh, We've done the scouts, we've done the tactical marines, the dreadnought, his multi-melter, firing at that uh, that truck over there, which should just be about in range. Does he hit? No, he misses with the multi-melter. Oh dear. The storm bolter then. Misses with that as well. The honoured brother, I don't know, some temporary damage to his, 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 uh, what are they called? Motion compensators, whatever, uh, stabilizers, something like that. He misses all of his shots at the truck, unfortunately. Which brings us to the assault phase. And the honoured brother is going to charge the war boss. He should be within six inches. I will measure it up. Yeah, he makes it in no trouble at all. And uh, this is going to be risky. Because the war boss could very well turn around and wallop this dreadnought. No problem whatsoever. But the dreadnought will get to fight first. Because his dreadnought close combat weapon isn't like a power fist. It doesn't make him fight last. So... About as big as one another, aren't they? Good grief. <laughs> Here we go. He's got three attacks with two base, one extra for charging. Um, problem is, he's going to hit on fives because he's weapon skill four, the Dreadnought, and the Warboss is weapon skill five. So, yeah. oh dear, yes. He misses with every single attack. The Warboss effortlessly parries and perhaps possibly just even takes the blows on his massive mega armor. The Honored Brother does not find his mark in close combat, which is bad news for him. Because the war boss is now going to fight back. The war boss has five attacks. He has weapon skill five, so he will hit this dreadnought on threes. Two attacks hit. He is strength ten with his power claw. Um, so we're going to roll d6 for penetration on both these. He gets a 14 and a 16. Both of those are penetrating hits. Okay, we get a three and a two. On the damage table, that will equate to... Weapon destroyed and immobilized. The Dreadnought is stuck. Something His his legs have been irreparably damaged. And uh, the Dreadnought is stuck where he is for the rest of the game. He cannot move. Um, he also has a weapon destroyed chosen by opponent, which in this case I think means the Space Marine player. So I think uh, we're going to have the Storm Bolter uh, ripped off by the War Boss. So we don't get to use that for the rest of the game either. He is now immobilized, and the only ranged weapon he has left is the multi-melter. There we go, I've popped down a little counter to remind us that he's immobilized. And now we're gonna go back over here to the captain and the orcs once again. It is going to be three attacks on the captain striking first because of his higher initiative. Hitting on threes, he hits three times, wounding on fours. He wounds once, which means he kills one more orc. The orcs will get to attack back now. Three attacks each. There's only three of them now, though. Hitting on fives. Oof, the orcs have been rolling hot today. They really blooming have. Okay, there we go. That's not statistically average in the slightest. All right. Winning on fours. They wound three times. He only has to fail one save, and this captain is toast. He fails one. The captain has fallen. There we go. Right, the uh, the orcs can now consolidate three inches if they wish. So they'll consolidate that way. They can also advance. Um, but I think you only get to do that against an enemy unit that is running away. In this case, they just straight up killed the captain. Um, removed him from play as a casualty. So I think they can just consolidate. Right, so the orcs have taken the right flank here. 
it's theirs. The Terminator has been wiped out and now so finally has the captain. Uh, which means that the Marines are pretty much just boxed into this one corner of the battlefield, which in terms of board control, which is important because this is a table quarters mission, is not very good. They also have a heavily damaged Dreadnought. Oh dear. Right, Orcs, turn three. Turn three, Orcs, movement phase is complete. And uh, this is what's happened. This mob has moved this way down towards the ruins of the church, which is the direction they probably should have gone in the first place. But in my defence, I was expecting the Terminators to put a lot more, put up a lot more of a fight, really. These three boys making their way around here to attack the, uh, to be very sneaky and attack these Marines from behind. This mob of boys here, they've moved down the street. They will be in charge range, just about, of these Marines here. Um, although I don't think a lot of them will be able to actually get into base contact. They can still attempt the charge. Obviously. Um, the war bosses remain in combat with the Dreadnought, and I've moved the knob into base contact with the Dreadnought as well. Now, the rules for, like, moving stuff um, in the movement phase when a part of your unit is in combat and part of it isn't is a bit fuzzy, and I think you're supposed to just apply common sense. In this case, it didn't matter, actually, because uh, that combat with the Dreadnought there was officially drawn, because Dreadnoughts don't ever fall back from combat. They stay until the combat is done. Um, which means that they, I, I could have made then a six inch move to get the knob into close combat with the Dreadnought, which I have now done essentially. I also made a little mistake last turn in that uh, the war boss's mob should have taken a morale test after all shooting from these guys. We'll just assume that the orcs kept rolling like they have done for the entire game and they passed it. So the war boss is leadership nine after all. So, okay. Right. I mean, in hindsight, that was probably quite an important role that would have made a difference. But, yeah, yeah, we'll just say that they passed it. We'll just say that they did. Right. Uh, it's it's one of the trickier things to remember, I find, finding with 3rd edition, is doing the morale checks immediately after shooting is done. Because I'm so used to modern 40k, where you have a morale phase at the end of the turn. Whereas in 3rd edition, you do morale straight away after casualties are taken. So... Anyway, that's about the size of it. Uh, we have a little bit of shooting to do. Um, there are some boys within slugger range of their targets, so I think we're going to start with this blob of boys here. They're going to be shooting their sluggers at the scouts in the windows of this building next to them. 13 shots from the sluggers at the scouts, hitting on fives. Wounding on fours. No wounds to be found, however. Lucky scouts. Okay, uh, these three fire in their sluggers, they get one hit, and they do get a wound. Three up save for the marines is made, so no casualties to shooting. Uh, we then move straight on to the assault phase, and the first thing that's going to happen is this mob of boys is going to charge these tactical marines. That's how we look after the charge. Uh, only two boys are actually in base-to-base -base contact. The rest will just be getting one attack for being within two inches, for those of them that are, anyway. Um, and that's it for charges. Uh, so, the problem here, really, unfortunately, is that the Marines will get to strike first. Because they are Initiative 4, and these Orcs are only Initiative 2. First up will actually be the Librarian. He has initiative five, so he goes first. And um, in the assault phase, he can use his other psychic power. It's not called Coruscating Flame. I don't know where the hell I got that from. But um, it's actually called Psychic Maelstrom or something. Psychic Storm. Anyway, a st Storm of something. It's, it's, the word Storm is involved, I'm sure of it. Um, so does he cast that successfully on a leadership test? He almost didn't there, but he has successfully done it on a 7. Um, so he does mean he gets to re-roll his failed attacks in close combat, which was one of them. Which he still misses anyway, so never mind. <laughs> but yeah, that's the, the one and only re-roll of the game, that. Re-rolls are very rare in 3rd edition. Okay, now he's got a wound on 4 pluses. He does wound twice, and his force axe is a power weapon, so he just kills two uh, orcs. Now... When you take casualties in close combat, what you're actually supposed to do is take away the ones in base-to-base -to -base contact first. 
So what we've now done, the librarian, is he's killed the two orcs that were in base-to-base -base contact. Um, which means the rest of them are just going to be these guys at the front here who can have their one attack each. And you're now probably seeing why being able to go first with higher initiative in combat can be really crucial sometimes. So, now it's going to be the rest of the marines that are within two inches, getting one attack each, which I think is just going to be the front three there. One hit, which does wound, six up save for the orc, no, so another orc is killed, get rid of you. And now it's the orc's turn, and it looks like we have four or five of them that are within two inches. So we have two hits, two successful wounds, and one failed save. So one space marine is felled. Let's get rid of you. And that concludes the combat. The orcs have lost three. The space marines have lost one. The orcs lose. They take a leadership check, which they pass again. What the hell? <laughs> These orc leadership rolls are ridiculous. Okay, that means the combat is drawn. That means we do a roll-off. Space Marines get a 5, the orcs get a 1. So the Space Marines can make their 6-inch move first, which has allowed them to wrap around the orcs and get all but one of them into base-to-base -base contact for next turn. The orcs then moved as well, getting every single boy into base-to-base -base contact. Um, and it would seem, really, that... that uh, Turn four, apparently, is going to be where most of the bodies hit the floor, in this combat, at least. Now, with that resolved, we'll go back over to here, and uh, the Dreadnought, injured as he is, will get to fight first with his two attacks. He hits twice. He wounds twice as well. And, uh, well, that swung quite quickly, because the Dreadnought close combat weapon is strength ten. And a war boss and a knob are both toughness four. The dreadnought close combat weapon also ignores armor saves, and that means that both of these guys, Zog and the knob with the power claw, have both been killed by the instant death rule. You do not survive getting hit by a dreadnought close combat weapon. It just does not happen. If that thing wallops you, it doesn't matter how much armor you're wearing. Wow. Okay. Um, I should have foreseen how quickly that could swing back, but it, yeah, there you go. So, that's a bit of a crippling blow to the orcs. They now lack anything on the table that can harm that dreadnought. On the bright side, the dreadnought is immobilized and is missing a storm bolter, but still. Woof! All right, before we move to Space Marines turn four, there's one thing I meant to do but actually forgot to do in this turn, which was move the orc truck, have it reverse back around here so it's out of range of the immobilized dreadnought's multi-melter. And out of line of sight too, I think, from there. Uh, so yes, that's that's now done. All right, it's the end of the movement phase for Space Marines turn four. I've pivoted the dreadnought around for dramatic effect, but he is, of course, not moving anymore. Uh, and the only other movement that has happened is the scouts have clambered out through the windows of this ruined building into the street, and they're going to charge the orcs from behind, surround them, and hopefully kill them. Scouts are not particularly brilliant in close combat. They're, in fact, they're about as good as a regular space marine in close combat, as far as I'm aware. Um, but everybody gets a plus one attack on the charge in 3rd edition, so it might be worth a punt. We shall see. Especially since they have higher initiative, and will get to strike before the orcs do. And that's pretty much it. That is, that is it. The Dreadnought. He has a multi-melter. He's going to shoot it at that mob of orc boys over there. Does he hit? He does. Does he wound? Of course he does. One boy is melted to slag. There we go. And that brings us swiftly to the assault phase. So the scouts will make their six inch charge move. Right, that's how it looks with the charge complete. And now it's time to get this Barney going, I suppose. Uh, we will start with the Librarian, because he has the highest initiative, as usual. It's four attacks. Oh, I keep forgetting. His Psychic Power. Six. Okay, he's rolled a ten there, which means he's failed the Psychic Test. No perils, but he's just failed the Psychic Test, because it's Leadership 9. Um, so he doesn't get to reroll that, too. Winning on fours. 
he gets three wounds, and he kills three orcs. So we'll remove the three orcs that are next to him. He cuts them down with ease. Librarians are quite skilled fighters in 3rd edition. Uh, as it turns out, arguably better on the attack, at least, than, than, a, than a captain. Anyway. Right. Uh, now it's going to be all those scouts attacking and the marines attacking as well simultaneously. I think I'll just do it all together at once. All right, it's a whopping 21 attacks from the marines. In spite of only half of them having charged. Less than half of them, actually. Okay, let's see. I think I might have knocked one there, but it's too late to find out. Let's get rid of everything that isn't a 4+. Plus. And it looks to me... Like, once again, the value of having a higher initiative score than your opponent, and therefore attacking more swiftly, cannot be understated. Uh, however, all of that does in fact only translate to three successful wounds. Amazingly. Three six-up saves, and the orcs make two of them. Oh my goodness me, so one orc has been killed. One singular orc has been felled, and now the orc boys will get to attack back. And there's not a lot of them left, but they do have three attacks each. All right, here we go. Sorry, I mean, I meant, here we go. Okay. They needed fours or better, and they've gotten some. Now they need five ups, because Orc boys are only a pathetic strength 3 in 3rd edition. Well, in this version of 3rd edition we're playing. And one marine dies. One marine dies. Uh, was that a hmm, good point, actually? Was that a scout or a marine? 4 up, it was a scout. So one of the marines cops it. Okay. Uh, we'll get rid of... I don't know. We'll get rid of you, I guess. Right, mostly thanks to the librarian, the orcs definitely lost that combat, so it's their turn to take a leadership check. They will have a minus one for being under 50% strength, and they'll have an additional minus two, I think, for being outnumbered two to one, at the very least. So, yeah, they finally, the orcs finally fail a leadership check. Now, with mob rule, with orcs, you roll to check size if you fail. And if you roll equal to or under the number of orcs still left in the mob, the orcs are just like, nah, it's all right, it's still enough of us, it's fine. And that's actually what I've just done. I rolled a double one, there's five orcs left, and uh, yeah, I rolled a two. So the orcs actually, they failed that leadership check, but actually it turns out, nah, it's all right, it's all right, we're having a good time, it's great. So the combat is once again drawn. And uh, let's see, the marines roll a 2, the orcs roll a 5, the orcs can move first, not that there's a lot of moving for them to do, but yeah, we can just make sure all of them are in base-to-base -base contact, and then we can just pile in all of the marines that are able to pile in, like so, and this combat will continue. Orcs turn 4 movement is done, and as you can see, the battle is slowly condensing down into one mosh pit in the middle of the table. Just the way we likes it. So, these three boys are about to make their charge into the rear of these space marines. These boys have made their way across here. I don't think they're going to be able to make a charge, though. And as you may have noticed, that I have rotated the Dreadnought back around to the direction it was facing when it was immobilised, because I realised something very important, which was that Dreadnoughts have a rear armour value of 10, which means that some lucky Orcs with Sluggers could potentially get a glancing hit on it. So as we head into the shooting phase, that's exactly what the Orcs are going to try and do. Everyone in that mob took, takes one look at the immobilised Dreadnought and goes, Ha ha, he's stuck, he can't move, everyone, let's shoot him! And they all start firing their sluggers at him en masse. At his rear, where he's most vulnerable. They've got to hit on fives. So we do have a few. And now they're going to need to roll sixes with their strength four sluggers to actually get any glancing hits. And they don't roll any. So no glancing hits. The, uh, the shots harmlessly ping off the backside of the Dreadnought this time. Assault phase now. These orcs can go in. Only the first one can make base-to-base -base contact, however. And now, we once more begin the sequence of mosh pit fighting. Beginning 
with the librarian who is in base to base contact with an orc. Four attacks at initiative five. He hits every single time. And uh, he wounds twice. No saves for the orcs. Two of them are immediately killed by his power axe. He is just chopping right through these lads right now. The regular marines haven't had much luck in the grand scheme of things, but this librarian has just been murdering orcs left, right, and center. I don't know what his kill count is at right now, but it must be quite impressive. All right, 13 attacks from the regular marines. Uh, they need four pluses to hit. Being on equal weapon skill with the orcs. They don't get a lot. They get two wounds. The orcs get six up saves. They don't make either. Another two orcs are killed. So we shall remove you. And we shall not remove you. Remove you. Away with you. Right. Now the orcs finally get to attack. And uh, we have four attacks on this boy that's charged here. One for each of his mates. And then there's one remaining orc in the middle. He will get three attacks. Here we go. Sorry, here we go. We get a total of two hits. One of them wounds. Three plus save on the marines. Is failed. One marine is cut down. However, the orcs have lost four guys in this combat. The marines have lost one. The orcs lose the combat, therefore. Morale checks need to be taken for this guy over here. He's going to have a minus three or four to this, I think, now. Um, with an eight, he'll fail that. Uh, can't check size because there's only one of them left. Uh, he will fail, and he would fall back ordinarily. However, he's completely surrounded, which means he is just completely cut down and killed. These three here... They make a leadership check. They roll an eight. They fail. Size check for mob rule. Uh, they fail that as well, which means that they are going to fall back now 2d6 inches. They fall back eight inches towards their closest board edge, which is going to be up there somewhere, I think. And off they go, running away. They've had enough. They've had a sudden outbreak of common sense, and they've decided, you know what, we, don't, we actually don't want to get killed by beakies. We'll, we'll go back so we can have another go later. So they're running away. Now, the interesting thing here is sometimes we're, we're, when, a, when a unit is falling back, it can regroup in the following turn. However, these guys can't because you can only regroup if you've got at least half of your guys left and they've only got three dudes left, so no chance. Ordinarily, they would not be able to regroup. They would continue moving off the board until they get to the edge and then leave. Um, they can shoot their guns as they fall back. But other than that, they don't play any real major part in the battle going forwards. However, with orcs, they have a thing called mob up. If a falling back unit of orcs gets within something like six inches or something like that, I think it might be less than that, yeah. I think it's within six inches of another mob of boys. You can then move them over to them. If you pass a leadership check, which they do, which means they can mob up, and these boys, they go, oh, oh, look, friends, we've got more boys. We can come back and have another go now. And they basically just join this unit. So these three boys, they came charging into those beakies from behind. Uh, didn't like the mauling they got in return. Decided, oh, I wish get out of here. There's more of them than there is of us. And then they ran over here. They got into the middle of the ruins. Met the other boys coming in the opposite direction. Were like, wait, we've got friends now. Let's go back. And that's what's happening. So there you go. Um, as for the Marines, they can either consolidate or they can advance. Now, I should have done this before I did that mob up thing, really, because here's the thing. If you advance and you beat your opponent's retreat roll, which was eight, you actually just kill them. It's called a... that's not called a sweeping advance, but... Um, yeah, you just it's, it, you, it, it, to represent the fact that they get cut down trying to run away and they're all killed. So we can either choose to consolidate three inches or we can decide to try and chase after them. In this case, I think I'm going to have the Marines consolidate three inches so they can form up another firing line and receive the incoming charge from the Orcs rather than go chasing after those three. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. There we go. They've used their three inch consolidate to sort themselves out, reorganize and get ready to face the next final wave of incoming orcs. 
as we head into Space Marines turn five. Turn five movement phase is done for the Space Marines and there has been no actual movement because our consolidate move managed to get us exactly where we want to be. This now means that the, uh, well, everybody here is, is stationary, which means we get the full effect of our ranged weapons at the Xenos Scum, which is going to be good. We're going to actually start with the Dreadnought. He's going to fire a multi-melter at these orcs, try and melt one of them. He hits. He melts one. That's one boy gone. Next, we're going to go with the scouts. So first of all, I'm going to do the heavy bolter. Three hits. Two wounds. Again, AP4, so two dead boys. Now the rest of the scouts fire in with their bolt guns and shotguns. They get... Six hits. They wound with all of them. And the orcs get no saves from these either. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six more dead boys. After that colossal bit of shooting from the scouts, the orcs now have to take a morale check. Uh, on a six, they will just about pass that, even with the minus one for being under 50% uh, of their unit remaining. So we now move on to this squad. Uh, we're going to start with the, the librarian. He's going to try and smite some orcs. Does he pass the morale check for, for his psychic test? You know, uh, yes, he does, is the answer. Um, so, does he hit with the smite? Yes, he does. We place the blast marker thusly. We catch all of them with it. Which means five attempts to wound on a four plus. Only one of them is wounded. No luck with smite today, really. But it's AP2, so another boy is killed. Right, missile launcher with a frag grenade. Frag, frag grenade, frag missile. Does it hit? It hits. Again, blast marker, it catches all of them. Four wound attempts on a four plus. The missile launcher has a bit more luck. This is AP6, so two more boys are just killed, no armor saves. It leaves two left. And uh, now all of the bolt guns. Here we go. And we have this many hits, wounding on fours, four AP5, the two remaining orcs are cut down, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is effectively the end of the battle. The orcs still have one truck. With, an, with a destroyed big shooter on the front of it lurking behind that building. But aside from that, they have been, all of them, wiped out to disciplined Space Marine bolter fire. For a while, I wasn't sure which way that was going to go, actually. The Orcs would look like they were making very good progress right up until the point where the Dreadnought walloped the war boss in one go. If the war boss had gotten a bit, if Zog had gotten a bit more lucky with his, with his damage roll on that Dreadnought, uh, this could be a very different game right now. But as it happens, um, the Space Marines were victorious. The Librarian rallied his brothers and uh, fought on to victory, even as the Captain and his Terminators were cut down by the Orcs on the opposite flank. The Honoured Brother has been has, has taken quite a bit of damage. His Storm Bolter is inoperative. His legs are inoperative. We're going to have to call in a Storm, a storm Raven. I was going to say Storm Ravens. They don't exist in 3rd edition. Call it a Thunderhawk or something, the Tech Marines, to get him out of here and get him repaired. But uh, we have successfully found a way through the Orc lines to lead the rest of the convoy onwards to the spaceport, where the Imperials can successfully evacuate and get the heck off this planet before more Orcs show up. And there's always more Orcs, so they need to get their skates on, but they have triumphed for the moment. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, folks. I hope you enjoyed it. That, out of the three, I've played three games now of 3rd edition, because I did two practice games before I decided to film this one, and this was probably the most one-sided of the bunch I've done, actually. The the Orcs actually won... Now, the first game I did was a draw. It was a total draw. I got to turn six, and both sides occupied the equal amount of table quarters, so it was a draw. Second game I played, the Orcs won it. They wiped out the Space Marines. This is the third game, and this was all with the same lists, by the way. 
Um, this third game, the Space Marines managed to clinch it by wiping out the Orcs and getting lucky in a couple of places, and admittedly getting kind of unlucky in another place over there. But uh, circumstance just kind of favoured them in the end. I think I made some poor choices as the Orcs, admittedly. One really bad luck thing was, was the, the truck over there, with Zog in it getting blown to pieces in turn one. I probably should have placed that somewhere it was less easy to be shot at, um, because the poor guy was just too slow to get over here and do any serious damage. Um, that was a real, the real downside of his mega armor is that he really needs that truck to get him within striking range, otherwise he's kind of screwed, as you saw here. However, I thought that was pretty good. I have to admit, my dabbling with 3rd edition has been good. I've been in really enjoying it. Um, I think my final conclusion is that yes, 3rd edition is as good as I remember it being. It is pretty darn fun. Bearing in mind this is like the very early 3rd edition we're playing here. Um, I can't speak as to what it's like if we start adding lots of codexes and stuff on top. However, you know, if people are interested in, in, in this, in these old hammer bat reps, I suppose I might call them, um, I can certainly do more. We can layer more stuff on top. We can introduce codexes and things and see how we get on. There's tons of other missions we can play. This was the most bog basic possible one to do in the book. There's loads of other cool ones. There's one, there's one where the attackers get respawning units against a small force of defenders. There's one where uh, one side has a set of bunkers and the attacker has to destroy or occupy all the bunkers to win and that's their only objective. Um, there's one where there's a force that's surrounded and they have to break out and get off the table to win. There's a really, really nice array of different missions you can do. Um, there's some recon and sabotage missions and stuff that involve sentries as well. Like there's a stealth element. It's really interesting stuff, honestly. I I, 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 I dig it. It's cool. Um, but yes, the verdict is I like 3rd edition, unsurprisingly. I think it's pretty good. I quite like this early 3rd edition as well with just the, the army list, the very basic ones in the core rulebook. Makes the game very basic, but still quite fun and very fast to play. There's plenty of flavor there still. Um, there's not a lot of special rules, but the ones that do exist are really good ones. And I, I'm firmly of the belief that, that you can get more flavor into an army by giving them one really interesting, fluffy, flavorful rule versus 10 really generic rules. Um, you know, I, I, I personally feel it works much better that way. Like the orcs with their mob up and their mob rule things they had going on. I thought that was really interesting. I like that a falling back unit of boys can bump into a bigger unit of boys and be like, oh, we found our brave pills now. We <laughs> feel like turning around and going back to have another go. That's a thing that's unique to orcs. You know, other factions don't get to do that. And all the other factions... Sorry, the battery's cutting me off again. It's probably my cue to get wrap this up, but... The other factions all have some other unique twists available to them, and once you add the codexes on top, they get more and more stuff too, but I like it. It's a very simplified form of 40k, but there's still flavor there. There's still enough to make it engaging to play. And considering I've now played three games with two identical lists, not identical lists, but three games with the same lists, with the same two factions against each other, and each one has been quite different, has played out very differently, and each one has been relatively close in the end as well. I think it says a lot. Um, so, yep, the third edition's pretty good. Um, the other thing I like about it is how fast it is to play. I managed to I managed to knock out this battle report in about two and a half hours, not including the time I had to spend recharging the battery on here, of course. But uh, compared to my usual ninth edition battle reports, which take me sometimes two entire freaking days to film, if it's a solo one, that's quite a difference, i got to say. I, I managed to finish this game in about the same length of time it takes me to play a round of Necromunda. So, that's that's something. I could fit three games of this into one game of 9th edition. Because uh, a game of 9th edition, even against an opponent like Dan, who knows what he's doing, often still takes about... Six. Thanks again, Battery. I was saying, a game against Dan usually still takes about six hours to play in 9th edition, whereas this... Two hours tops, probably less if I was playing against an or uh, an actual opponent instead of just playing against myself. Yeah, it's good. Anyway, uh, so that's it, folks. Hope you enjoyed. Give us a like. Give us a subscribe if you if you fancy it. Um, and yeah, let me know if you like this kind of battle report because I'm happy to do more of them. We can explore more of third edition, more books, more stuff like that. 
um, maybe even other editions at some point. I think it's an interesting little niche. It's a niche within a niche within a niche within a niche. So I'm not expecting this to be stupidly popular, but still, it's, it's interesting to me. So anyway, let me know if you want to see more. I'll see what I can do. Anyway, uh, that's it. That's it. We're done. I'm going to go before the battery dies again. Toodaloo.